party. And in this panel called on terrorism and genocide, I just wanted to say briefly that it was Chairman O'Malley in, that raised up at first the hypocrisy and white nationalism of raising up the murder of white people by Hitler as the worst thing done to humans by other humans when the word genocide, as well as the existence of the, United, of the United Nations with its Human Rights Charter and its Convention on Genocide, didn't even exist when Af as African people were slaughtered, kidnapped, brought into slavery. It wasn't even a consideration. And for raising that up, he was banned from the University of Santa Cruz, being told that he was anti-Semitic, written up in all kinds of Zionist newspapers, and um, you know, for speaking a basic truth that white people don't want to hear. Right. And, on the question of parasitism, it was Chairman O'Malley that developed the understanding of parasitism as the political and economic definition of the relationship imposed by Europe onto African and other colonized people. And this is a completely different political and economic analysis than what you will hear or what we've been versed in from those who will call themselves Marxists or from, um, you know, the progressive white community. It's a completely different worldview from the Eurocentric view that most of us, are, that we are all trained in. And so I really want to urge particularly the North Americans that are here today to carefully consider what is being said and not just to, you know, feel good about the presentation and, you know, not to just to enjoy the presentation, but to really consider what's being said and to raise questions that you have, seriously, to raise any questions that you have with the analysis that's put out and to really try and come to grips with what it means for, in terms of what we need to be doing. So I want to welcome Chairman O'Malley and Shikala. Uhuru. I'd like to, uh, again, express our appreciation to the African People's Solidarity Committee for making uh, this Af African People's Solidarity Day weekend occur. I also want to say that to people who've listened to what's already happened on last on yesterday and the quality presentations we've had already on today, uh, it should be quite obvious that something is happening here. That we've had over the last 20 years or so, subsequent certainly to the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s, a lot of talk fests going on, which were designed essentially to make people feel good. That's right. And uh, they call themselves political rallies and the rest of it. Everybody could leave feeling good. Uh, but it really did nothing to change anything. And what this is about is a real struggle uh, to present some kind of scientifically based assessment of the world as it is, not as we'd like for it to be, but as it really is. And we want to provide some kind of scientific assessment of the world as it is, because most of us are involved in attempting to change the world. So this is not a session, uh, these two days, where we come together for the purpose of feeling good, Going back, uh, being able to talk about the good speech that somebody made, yeah. uh, that we somehow are these bystanders uh, who watched the process occur, and that's it. These uh, serious discussions that we're having, and we're hoping uh, that they serve to inform practice, mm -hmm. that people will actually uh, become involved. We are a revolutionary organization, the African People's Socialist Party. And we truly believe that genuine social transformation in the world comes as a consequence of the activity of human beings, the informed activity of human beings. That we have a responsibility to change the world. That is the thing that distinguishes human beings from other animals. In so many ways, humans are just like all the rest of the animals. We eat, we sleep, yeah. uh, we have bowel movements, we procreate, and the rest of it. But the thing that distinguishes the human being is consciousness. We don't even have to, to call it human consciousness would be redundant. Yeah. It is consciousness that distinguishes us from the other animals. And because we have consciousness, we can make predictions about the kind of world that we want to live in, and we can move forward to make the world in that way. That is, it is human consciousness 
that was distinguishes us from a cow. It is human consciousness that determines that when we go to a McDonald's, we're on one side of the counter and the cow is on the other side of the counter. Uh, so that is why we are involved in this session because we want to inform consciousness so that we can change the world. We are a revolutionary organization. All social transformation has occurred as a consequence of revolution. It doesn't happen accidentally. Revolution is the, is the basis of social transformation. Now, we live in a world that's dominated by social forces who hate revolution, who fear revolution. The ones who control the newspapers hate revolution. The one who controls the school books hate and fear revolution. The one who controls the movie theaters hate revolutions, and the ones that have the mortgages to the churches also hate revolution. So, as a consequence of that, everything you know and hear of revolution is bad, is evil, and all revolutionaries are bad and evil. But the people who need revolution the most are the majority of the people on the planet Earth. It is the majority who need revolution and who cannot live without revolution. We've listened to what Osainu and what Comrade Latif have had to say and about the war that even makes our ability to survive and to procreate problematic as colonial peoples. I wanted to comment just briefly uh, on something that was said in that regard. I don't know if people know that the Israelis had a policy of catching Palestinian Arab children and breaking their arms. I mean, literally, there, there were actually televised programs that horn their arms and beating them with clubs to break their arm as a form of punishment. Uh, that was, that's policy, that was policy. That was policy under Rabin, the good guy. Rabin is the good guy who has just been elected in, the moderate guy. Uh, but they, we talk about a situation where actual life is problematic. You look at, somebody quoted the difference in the infant mortality rates for African people right here in Philadelphia and for white people in Philadelphia because life is actually problematic for most of us around the world. And there's an attempt to depopulate the world by the people, by a white power, which is a minority. So it would reduce the rest of us. And this is an extraordinary uh, thing that we're talking about because this whole question of overpopulation is uh, fantastic. Here they talk about overpopulation, right? Where you have a situation where at best, 20, 25% of the population of the world controls and consumes 80 to 85% of the resources of the world. So where is there too many people? The 20 and the 25% is the goddamn too many. If anybody needs to be reduced, it's that 25% that's got 85% of the world's population. But the, the question of the production and reproduction of real life, mm -hmm. that is, in fact, the motive force in human society. Mm -hmm. It is this whole process of production and reproduction of human life. That is the driving force in all human society. So what we look at, though, is this whole process. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the rise of white power as capitalism in the world was an aggression, was an attack on the ability of the rest of the world to produce and reproduce real life. That's what we've been looking at over the last 500 years, at least. And for Africa, we're talking about Africa having been at war for the last 1,000 years. Uh, there's been an aggression coming down against Africa. We want to have this discussion uh, not as some kind of feel-good thing, because uh, obviously anybody who's just looking for a place to feel good uh, obviously is in the wrong place when they come here. Uh, and that is also one of the reasons uh, that we start this process in terms of the people who are willing to participate at a different place uh, than some other programs that you might go to. Because it is easier to go to a place where that's designed to make you feel good 
than it is to talk about the way the world really is, the way the world really is. And, and it is easier to go and be a spectator in a process than to come to terms with the fact that if the world is going to change, then it is upon us to change it. You go to see the OJs perform and nobody gets on the, on the stage with them. It's just the OJs performing. Everybody can leave feeling good, uh, marveling at how well they sing. But and to make a social revolution, something else has to happen. Uh, the audience has to become a part of the process of transformation. To make a revolution is not an easy thing. If it were, everybody would be involved in it. They probably would call it something else too, yeah. you know? Uh, but it is not an easy thing. And it, there are certain things which are necessary in order for a revolution to occur. Some of them are relatively obvious. You need a crisis. Uh, you need, uh, uh, to make revolution, you need, uh, the inability of the ruling class to rule in the same old way. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> you need, uh, uh, to make a revolution, you need uh, the people to have reached a conclusion that it's better to die than to live like this. Mm -hmm. People have to have come to yeah. that conclusion. That's what the Intifada was yes. inside uh, Palestine. People said, the, the guns don't frighten us anymore. Breaking the arm don't frighten us anymore. That there's nothing that we won't do in order to change these circumstances. I have some problems with the leadership yeah. of the Palestinian movement who kept the people disarmed, yeah. who told the people not to pick up arms, yeah. but that in fact, that is a prerequisite for making revolution. The people have to have come to a conclusion that nothing worse can happen to us than yeah. what is already ha happening yeah. to us. In order to make a revolution, we also have to have a revolutionary organization. A revolutionary organization is a prerequisite for making a revolution. Who ever heard of a revolution happening any place on the planet that didn't have a revolutionary organization at its, at its, at its leading force? With a revolutionary cadre, that is to say people, human beings who have come to a conclusion that we have, that my occupation has to be revolution that I, my profession is revolution, that I might do something else for a living in the interim, but my profession is yeah, revolution, because right. yeah. as long as things exist the way they exist in this world, then I have to be preoccupied with overturning this kind of rotten right. social system. Yeah, right. See, that is, that is the highest expression of humanity, because that is the essence of humanity, that is human consciousness at its highest level, right? Yeah. And then in order, in order to make a revolution occur, this revolutionary organization must be guided by advanced revolutionary theory. Yeah. That revolution does, yeah. doesn't come from anywhere. You have to have a scientific, realistic assessment of the world, how things are, what the possibilities of things to come, and then a revolutionary organization to do that with. Yeah. So you have to be, have a revolutionary organization guided by revolutionary theory. That's why we're doing this. That's what this discussion is about, not just some, some uh, uh, intellectual masturbation that, uh, that's uh, so popular in university <laughs> cities as occur here. Right. You know right. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, where information and education are wonderful unto themselves, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, yeah. above Side, society and yeah. social needs of human beings. We're not talking about any nonsense like that. Nothing like that. So that's why we're having this discussion. Now listen, and that is also why ruling classes throughout history, oppressive ruling classes have struggled to have a monopoly on information, to have a monopoly on science, they will keep science for themselves in a closet over here. And, and then they will feed you uh, nonsense like, uh, uh, what's this stuff you read in the newspaper, Gene Dixon, where some person is making astrology and the rest of it. They got science, they give you astrology. Check it out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They got the New York Times, they give you the Post. Your New York Post with pictures of naked women and uh, weird uh, stories and the rest of it. The stuff at the supermarkets uh, uh, and the rest of it. You know? Uh, they, they, they 
monopolize science, they monopolize uh, information for themselves yes. and feed pablum to the rest of the people. Right. That's why you got these crazy white people who don't know shit. White people are the most backwards yeah. people yeah. on the planet Earth who don't know nothing about the real goddamn world. Right. Who don't, oh, wait a minute. Who don't understand their own government, don't understand their own state. You want to understand America, talk to a Palestinian who's never right. seen America, but has seen the effect of Americanism right, right there in the Middle East. Yeah. You want to understand, you want to understand America, talk to an African who lives in West Philadelphia in, in, in the kinds of circumstances where we live in, where there are no lights, where we're living by candlelight and sometimes yeah. having to use candlelight yeah. as heat in the winter. We'll tell you what America and Americanism is. But white people don't know anything about this country yeah. or this yeah. government. It was extraordinary to most African people in this country when Richard Milhouse Nixon was overthrown because of what they said they learned about Nixon and the government through the Watergate tapes. They heard him use profanity. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the term expletive deleted <laughs> came into the, into the, the vocabulary here. They heard him say dirty things about Jews and other people. Hell, what do you think the word spit and wetback and nigger and coon and the rest of that came from? What do you think camel jockey came from? Do you think Nixon made that up? This country was founded in this kind of garbage. And America and Americanism has always been that. We could have told you about your politicians. We tell you about policemen in our community who rape women all the time, who sell drugs, and who are involved in the worst kinds of crimes against black people That's right. and other people. That's right. But we know about America, but you don't know about America because you don't have to. And America bribes white people to keep them fat and loyal and stupid. Right. And stupid. <laughs> and, and, and immune to the pain and misery Yes. that's inflicted on the rest of the peoples of the world. Yes. And we're not talking about just the concept and the abstract. We're talking about, when we talk about the problematic of life, we talk about the struggle to keep African people from being able to reproduce real life ourselves. It's not just an abstract question that we're talking about. We're talking about Sister Shuisi, whose son Sadiq was murdered, was murdered. But we don't know how many policemen shot him in the truck because they said he stole a goddamn car radio. You understand? We're talking about a whole population of African population in Philadelphia who have to live in circumstances that human beings cannot live in. It's impossible to do it. The fact that we do it is, has to say more about who we are than than what is supposed to be possible. We're talking about Camden, New Jersey, and Africans who have to survive in that garbage and cross city Florida. We're talking about Oakland, California, and all of the goddamn conditions which are imposed upon us, which people read about in the newspapers every day, hear about on television, and somehow can dismiss it because it's outside of the realm of what happens to human beings. It's just something that happens to black people and people who are not white. And people who are not white. So we're having this discussion, this, this weekend, this African People's Solidarity Day, because we're talking to a different group of people, essentially, who have to be involved in changing the world, not in just getting information that's useful at the barber next barbershop discussion yeah, okay. or something like that, but who are interested in changing the world and changing our relationship to the world. And I think that's important. I want to congratulate, too, the African People's Solidarity Committee for doing this courageous thing. Yes. Because to be, to, to reject whiteness, yeah. to, to be able to reject whiteness, yeah. and I'm talking about whiteness, the ideology, right. uh, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about, whiteness, the ideology, which is found in South Africa, yeah. as well as in Philadelphia, yeah. and particularly in places like Israel and the rest of it, because what, for all, Israel is a white nationalist settler state, yeah. just like South Africa. Yeah. There ain't no difference in South Africa and Israel. Both right. of them are the same. Yeah. 
Right. You understand? And and there, any any pretense at uh, making it something else is just white nationalist self-serving bullshit. That's the best that can be said about that. So we want to pull together people who are interested uh, in changing the world, and that's uh, that's what this is about. I want to say that it demands of us that we have to change some things the way we understand the world. Uh, because in the past, white people are so quick to say, uh, defensively, the white people are generally the most thin-skinned people in the world. You know, uh, and that's extraordinary given the names they've given everybody else. You know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, um, and so, you know, in every instance you begin this discussion, uh, white people say, well, you know, I didn't have anything to do with that. I didn't know my father or my mother, grandmother, or a long time ago somebody did it, you know. Well, I didn't have anything to do with it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. You didn't have anything to do with it, I didn't have anything to do with it. Oh. Slavery is both our legacies. It's mine and it's yours. Right. You, you inherited the wealth of slavery and I inherited the poverty of slavery. I am determined to change this legacy that's been left up to me. If you don't change yours for yourself, I'm going to change yours too. So it's best for you to join this one and both of us change ourselves. That is the basis then for a realistic, a realistic, equitable transformation of this thing. But as long as white people try to hold on to all the shit that they inherited that came from slavery, you're out of your goddamn mind if you don't think we coming to get the shit. And we'd be out of our minds if we didn't come to get this shit. We'd be lunatics. We'd be Jesse Jackson followers or some other kind of stupidity like that. Woo. So the world has to change and people, we have to reassess this place that we're in, not based on some kind of superstition or fantasy, but on the real deal. We were in California uh, several years ago and there was a group of Africans who were breaking into the houses of upper class, not upper class, upper middle class white people and committing atrocities against them while robbing them. And uh, during one of the trials, a woman who had been victimized, I mean, they were really committing serious acts on, on, the, on the white people. Uh, one of the woman's, women who was white women who was victimized by this group uh, testified during the trial that <laughs> when it happened to her, she thought the revolution had come. <laughs> and hers was the first house that they had got to. Now, the brothers didn't use no revolutionary language or anything like that, uh, but they just assumed that yeah. black people kicked in their doors start yeah. kicking their asses, right? Yeah. That the revolution had come. Now, why in the hell would this white woman think revolution? Yeah. I mean, why not just robbers, crooks, and anything but revolution? Yeah. And the reason is because yeah. deep in the consciousness of every white person in this country is an assumption that one day niggas gonna get back at us for all this shit that we have done. But the, but the reality is that African people are not vicious, violent people. That's just a figment of your imagination. That's something that white people have needed to think and put positive about African people for themselves. Because if we were, the babies that we raised, which were your babies, would not have ever come to life. The houses that we cleaned, which your, were your houses, would not exist today. You understand? And the streets that we paved and built, the youth would not be there. Now, the reality is that we are not that kind of people. You want to attribute to us that which is of you. That ain't us, that's you. That's you who have done that. That's you who have mixed and, and, and burned and cut off the different uh, parts of flesh and dragged black people through the streets like animals and yeah. hanged us and cut babies out of mother's womb and made yeah. cat bands out of, out of the uteruses of women and cut yeah. their vaginas out and tied them yeah. around saddle horns. That's yeah. you. African people yeah. have never done that. That's you who kidnapped us and who made us work for you for nothing for hundreds of years.
the people there and yeah. change the territory. So what used to be Iraq is now Kuwait. And when the Iraqis go back to where their home that's now called Kuwait, you call them invading, and then you invade them. That's you who spread us throughout the world, who changed our names, changed our culture, took our religion, and everything about us. We have never, ever, ever done anything like that. you down in the streets. Right. We never waited in the dark to cut your throats. We never did all of the things which you assume we're going to do. We tell you now, we just want to make a revolution, change this shit, set it off on equal terms, then white people will be just like everybody else. You got to go for yourself. Ain't nobody going to be doing your shit for you. And people can talk and not have to worry about hurting your fucking feelings. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, I can be who I want to be and don't have to worry that you're going to make but you're going to think I'm going to rob you. Uh, we just going to do our own shit. And you're going to have to, you're going to have to take your chances just like everybody else. Come up to me, well, uh, after the revolution, uh, how do you think things going to be? Which is, translate this, what's going to happen to the white people? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all going to have to get a fucking job like oh. everybody else. Some white people are saying something about uh, uh, they don't work. What the hell are you talking? We don't work. They, we don't have the work ethic. That's why you came to get us over Africa, right? You look for basketball players. <laughs> <laughs> it is white people who don't know the meaning of work. White people have never, never, never worked for 500 fucking years. You haven't had to do a goddamn thing. Somebody did everything for you. Yeah. That is the literal truth. I mean literal. I'm not trying to talk hyperbole here. I'm talking about the literal truth. I know. I know. I know. Got up every morning around 5 o'clock. Had to go feed the chicken. Had to take horns, slop the hogs. On the dead people's land. Yeah. The fucking yeah. Indians yeah. who you right. killed Ooh. would have much Ooh. rather done it for themselves. Yeah. That is the real deal. Ooh. You understand yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah. On dead people's land. Don't tell about how hard your grandmama worked. God damn it, worked somebody else's land. Right. They yeah. killed the goddamn Indians right. first right. And, and gave them smallpox, infested right. blankets, right. and the rest of it, and murdered them, right. and hunted them down like animals, right. and scalped them, and got paid for every fucking right. scalp that you brought in. Right. You think. You did hard work. How hard Ooh. do you think the goddamn Indians were working Ooh. to try to get you off hey. their goddamn backs? Ooh. That is the work. Hey. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not even, you know, uh, don't, let's not get hung up. I'm, I'm about to do the old traditional things. Apologize to the white people for telling the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry, at this point, this point I'm supposed to say, I'm not a racist. <laughs> 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 That's history, god damn it. Right. Uhuru. That's history. That's history. <laughs> we gonna tell it. Yeah. That's what Uhuru. this is about. This hour day. You got yeah. we got two days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this one of them, god damn it, we gonna tell it. <laughs> I wanna just say uh briefly some things about uh, political economy. We talked a little bit about it yesterday, but there's so much mystification around the whole question of political economy. I think it's really important for us to come to terms with this huge contradiction in the world where this tiny minority of all the people on the planet Earth, the only people who live in some kind of security, some kind of security, uh, economic security, uh, uh, people who don't have to worry about how they're going to eat, people who, generally speaking, are not, uh, uh, don't have to worry about uh, uh, who's going to invade their homes and kill them or things like that, people who have to make up stuff to frighten themselves with, you know, who have to go bungee jumping, you know, uh, uh, I, saw, I saw somebody on, I, I saw somebody, 
you know, on TV the other day who was uh, doing what they call sky surfing. Here's a joker who jumped out of an airplane with a surfboard tied to his feet. You understand? Uh, who has to uh, create horrors for themselves, you know, like space people from out, out of the, from another galaxy who's come to scare them. Well, the average person on the planet is scared of white people, scared of the slumlord. You know, you don't have to look up nothing yeah. extra, you know, scared of the goddamn police, uh, you know, scared that uh, 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 what's going to happen to your child if it goes to school, if it can go to school, scared the crack of who you worked for last week ain't going to pay you like he said he was going to pay you, scared scared that the yeah. goddamn welfare fast is gonna come look under your yeah. bed and find yeah. somebody's shoes, yeah. some damn shoes. I mean, that, you know, people who, you know, uh, got real fears on the one hand, but then you got this whole group of other people uh, who live in security Ooh. and who have to make up shit to scare them. Right. You know I mean, uh, who are so yeah. unaccustomed to being afraid, yeah. who are so well protected, right, that they do the dumbest things in the world, you know, uh, like uh, sometimes or even uh, walk in the middle of the black community with all this stolen loot and shit, you know, go jogging in the middle of Central Park, which has been devastated in New York, a banker, and ain't nothing supposed to happen to your little ugly ass. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the dumbest shit, you know. All right. I mean, you know, this is. You know, I can't go jogging. I feel, I, I don't, I don't, shit. <laughs> 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 oh, so we want to just say uh, a few things to uh, sort of explain a little bit, try to come to terms with how the world is as it is. And I want to, while in general, uh, we could talk about uh, the whole world, I want to just concentrate just a little bit on Africa and our relationship to it. And I mean everybody in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. African people got a special relationship to Africa. I hope we hip to that. Yeah, yeah. I hope everybody in the, in the room, uh, every African in the room recognize that's where we are. We Africans. Because yeah. you can't get on no ship in Africa in 1619 as an African, right? And then get off in Jamestown, Virginia as a Negro. Right? Uh, if you got on the ship as an African in Africa, when you got off the goddamn ship, you were still an African. You know that's the way it works, really, right? Yeah. Unless that was some kind of mysterious ship, right? Unless that was the ship that Jonah was on and fell off and got swallowed up by the great fish, you know. But if it was a regular ship, when you, in 1619, when you put your yeah. ass over that in Africa, when you took your ass off, you were still in Africa. Because yeah. that's just simple, yeah. that's just logic, you know. Now, a lot of nonsense has been passed around since that time. Well, I used to be in Africa. But yeah. my grandmother... Well, great, 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 great grandmother was born in Africa, uh, but you know, I was, I was born uh, in Mississippi, uh, some nonsense like that, you know. And Malcolm, you had a great rejoinder for that. He said that sometimes uh, kittens are born in ovens, but that don't make them biscuits. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you can cut down a tree, and then you can take all the branches from the tree and then drag it to the river. You can throw it in the river and leave it there for a million, million years, and it will never turn into a crocodile. It will never turn into a crocodile. So if you got on the ship as an African, when you got off the ship, you're African. If you don't think like you're an African, then do what Michael Jackson did, cut off your lips and turn them in on your way out the door. <laughs> <laughs> so it is fundamentally important for us to understand who we are because we got some work to do Africans we got some work to do and it's important to know because things happen to us and if you don't know who you are you don't even know what's happening to you so you sit up and look at what's happened to them Africans who they sweep up on the wall and shores of Miami and say look at what they're doing to them Haitians you understand what is the first thing a thief does when they steal something scratch the name off and maybe call it something else come to Africa go to Africa uh, take what used to be known as Azania, change the name to, to South Africa, take over the land and the rest of it, now they act like it's always been like that, right? Call themselves South Africans, right? What do they do? They leave Europe, 
go to some place called Palestine, kill the people, possess the land, change the name from Palestine to Israel, call themselves Israel, and act like they've always been there. You understand what I'm saying? They scratch the name off. That's the first thing they do. And then they disperse Africans all over the world. Now we're not Africans anymore. We are, first we was niggers, you know, and coons, and all other kinds of dirty names that they could come up with. Now the shit, you getting hipper and hipper, so they have to call you an African, but now they make you an African American. You understand? You better cut loose that hyphen. Because that hyphen is a chain that's trying to hold your ass in slavery, that's keep right. you on the plantation. That's you right. can't be an African and American at the same time. That's a contradiction in terms because America was born at the expense of Africa. That's like calling yourself a slave and a slave master at the same time. It's an impossibility. You're supposed to hate America. You're supposed to hate America. And hate Americanism. How can you love America given what America has done to you. Yes. How can anybody love America given how America came into existence, killing Indians, slaughtering Africans, and built off slavery? No decent, right-thinking human being on the planet ought to be able to love America. You don't even have to be black to hate what this sucker stands for. Anything born in shit can't be nothing but shit. to the Africa and this thing that they call slavery. Mm -hmm. When you hear anybody talk about slavery today, they're not talking about Kirk Douglas and Spartacus. Mm -hmm. You understand? When people think slavery, they think about us. Mm -hmm. You understand? When a white woman puts her foot down and says, you treat me just like I'm a slave, she ain't talking about Spartacus and Kirk Douglas. She's talking about you treat me like I'm a nigga. Mm -hmm. You understand? The point is the, that slavery has, the slave has become almost a generic term for Africa, mm -hmm. right? And, but this thing that happened to us cannot be characterized as slavery proper because it was not a mode of production. The mode of production that existed was capitalism. This thing called slavery is a primary factor that gave birth to the thing that called, that's called capitalism in the world. You hear what I'm saying? So the rape, and this is important too because we've had some Africans in Africa one of, the, one of the giants in Africa, in my view, Amilcar Cabral, uh, who disagreed uh, with the concept that Africans inside this country were colonized. We were a colonial people. We exist as a colonized part of Africa. You understand? He disagreed. He thought that our struggle should be something to, uh, be, to struggle for some kind of equality inside, inside of this country. And that he said that, that, that what happens to us did not meet like the classical definitions of colonialism, but which is nonsense. Because in, in the real sense, it is probable, it is possible that we were colonized here before Africans were colonized in Guinea-Bissau, where he came from. That is some possibility that it, it occurred in that fashion. And secondly, that colonialism never looks the same everywhere. That it's got special features everywhere it exists. And then thirdly, to cut Africans off like this, Cabral was making a profoundly important error, just as some Africans in this era who call themselves new Africanists, who, right. who decided that black people down south someplace in, yeah. in five states or in Mississippi or in Tennessee represent some kind of new nation. You cut yourself off from your whole historical process and you cut yourself off from all the other Africans who are suffering from the same contradiction, given birth by the same process as each other. Are we clear? So, but here, uh, we have a situation where, where Europe 
went into Africa and attacked Africa in a very vicious, uh, serious way. People had some problems understanding this, and Africans, after a while, bought into the psychology ourselves of white superiority. People say, well, white people, and not, not only Africans, but other people too, oh, suspect yeah. white people must really be superior. Right. Because the evidence of the superiority of white people is the fact that they dominated everybody else. So you say, well, goddamn, white people run everything. You know, you, you wonder in your own mind. This motherfucker might be really superior. You understand? Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, and because there, there seems to be this real material evidence of superiority. But that's only at the juncture you begin to change the definitions of, of certain human values. Because everywhere the European went, they ran into open societies, not closed societies the way European societies are closed. Typically, historically closed, hate strangers, hate foreigners. Not only do they hate black people, but they hate other kind of white people. As soon as their chance comes, they start killing everybody else. And if they don't kill them like they're doing it, like they're doing in Yugoslavia, they start doing like they're Jeffrey Dahmer. They eat yeah. you. you understand? <laughs> but uh, there's this whole uh, historical, you know, uh, thing at work that that was a distinctive difference. Some people said it was superior weapons. It was not superior weapons that made the difference. It was not superior weapons. It was a whole different psychology born out of a whole different set of cir circumstances in Europe that was different than what existed in Africa. You, you really have to come to grips with that and, and, and understand that. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to the superiority concept. Yeah. Now, I don't believe vandalism is superior to civilization. I don't believe barbarism is, and I'm uh, using these terms uh, I'm using, I'm talking actual, actual <coughs> vandalism. I'm talking about a whole part of Northern Europe where people were known as vandals and where the concept that we know of as vandalism today comes from groups of tribes of white people who just ran around looting and robbing and shit. That was, their, that was how, you know, they produced and the rest of that. You just read Hagar, Hagar the Horrible in the comics. You know, that's one of my favorite strips. You know, see what <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, the, and the barbarians, these were actual forces that existed inside Europe. And it was a way of existing. So, I mean, I know it's got turned vast backwards. Now we are the barbarians and the vandals and Europeans are the civilized forces. This is extraordinary. I mean, if you know if there was a black word for barbarian, they would have come up with it. Yeah. yeah. If there was a black word for vandal, if there was a term in African history, that's what they would be using. They wouldn't be calling it vandals. They wouldn't be calling it a white thing. They wouldn't use a white term to define something bad. If, it was, they, if there was anything worse than what they was doing that was black, that's what it'd be known of. It'd right. be called Zuluism. You're right. <laughs> uh, 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 or something to that effect. Yeah. If vandal is the worst thing they could come up with. Mm -hmm. And they had to extract that from the history of Europe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a different yeah. story. Out of Africa, out of, uh, we had this attack on Africa uh, that, uh, that uh, was a part of come to know be known as what we call as the slave trade. And uh, this was uh, something that uh, also coincided with a lot of aggression that was going on against other peoples in the world. But Africa was central to this uh, development of what we now know as capitalism, know as capitalism, and what is in fact white power. Uh, it is central for uh, several reasons. One key reason of its centrality is because for the rise of capitalism, uh, there needed to be a world economy. And it was the trade in black people. I'm not even talking now about the labor stolen from black people, which uh, represented a form of what they call primitive accumulation of capital, but the actual trade in black people, that dispersal of black people all over the world that hooked up for the first time in human history a world, a single world economy. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that human beings did not trade with each other around the world before. The Arabs were in all kinds of places. Africans circumnavigated a fleet of, at least one fleet of ships uh, circumnavigated the continent of Africa 4,000 years ago, you know, 4,000 years ago. Uh, and if anybody who's seen pictures of the Olmec heads uh, in southern, in Mexico and, uh, uh, in, in southern Mexico and parts of Central America, these huge heads who look like my nephew, uh, <laughs> which have been there for thousands of years, there's plenty of evidence of the 
travels of African people uh, around the world. And anybody who knows anything about the history and structure of the pyramids in Egypt, who can compare them to the pyramids uh, of the Aztecs and, and other forces down in the, in the Americas, can see the, the transfer, the cultural and scientific transfer from one place to the other. So trade was definitely occurring. And it was only the Arabs who, who called this place Europe, Europe. It was the, the concept uh, uh, up until the 17th century, uh, Europe was not known as Europe. There was no single concept of a European or a Europe, except for the Arabs. Uh, the others were like Hagar and the Horribles and warring tribes and, and the rest of that. So, uh, but there was no single world economy. One economy hooked up. So the whole economy was hooked up into world one, one process. That was what happened from the slave trade, which was taught to us in school as the triangle of trade. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. This was what we're talking about, the rise of the single world economy. <coughs> now, this world economy resulted in like a huge depopulation of Africa. <coughs> Africa is underpopulated today. I don't care, you care how many babies they tell you born per 100,000 in Kenya, which is supposed to, I think, be the highest, the fastest growing population and something like that in the world. Africa is underpopulated. It is one of the reasons that Africa suffers today. Because instead of it being in Africa at home, where shilling has, was mastered and invented, <laughs> you understand? Uh, and, and instead of being in Africa, where producing for Africa, we're in Philadelphia producing for the enemies of Africa. We're in, in, uh, in, in Trinidad producing for the enemies of Africa. We're in Haiti producing for the enemies of Africa, etc. Africa is, is underpopulated as a consequence of that. But it's not just that. We, so we have all these Africans now dispersed around the world and a whole economy being built, a whole world economy being built around this dispersal. Whole nations which never existed before have come into being. Of course, a Cuban. What's a Brazilian? What's much of what is now known as Latin America and the rest of that? What's the Caribbean? Whole groups of people who didn't even exist before. What's a Puerto Rican? You know, all of this, you know, comes as a consequence. That's the significance of the whole dispersal of Africa and changing the contours of the face of the earth, right? Now, so that's a, a crucial uh, component of the rise of capitalism. That was a prerequisite for the rise of capitalism in the world economy. Then, of course, there was the actual looting of Africa, which is uh, it's extraordinary. It was, it's so significant, yet it has become uh, such a tradition that it's no longer considered looting. And, and, and Africa is, uh, for example, you may not know that the so-called uh, gross national product of Africa is exactly equal to its debt. <laughs> so, did you know that? That the gross national product of Africa is just about equal to its debt, to the debt, the so-called debt that Africa owes to Europe and North America. <laughs> That's like sharecropping. You know, when you never, no matter how much you work, you know, you still always own, you always owe this stuff at the end of the month, etc. And that is because, uh, because since, since slavery, the structures of, of the economy, of the whole world economy, has been that it bleeds Africa just like other places in the world. All the resources are going out of Africa, going to North America. Take the Middle East for exa as an example. In the Middle East, 60 to 70 percent of the known oil reserves are being pumped out of there. Makes a handful of people very rich, the masses of people suffer, except in Kuwait. Did you know in Kuwait they don't even have mechanics and things like that? It, they, they are wealthy. The, the Palestinians and other people come from other places and do their dirty work for them in Kuwait. The yeah, the Iraqis as well, you know. But uh, so you have uh, like this huge transfer of wealth coming out of Africa, starting with slavery, okay? Starting with the slavery, the most important wealth, the most important value in Africa, the human being itself being pumped out of Africa. Mm -hmm. Then, with, because so much loot leaves Africa, comes to Europe, uh, and eventually into what's called North America, the industry and what have you begins to develop inside Europe. And this is crucial because here we're going to see the change in, in all history. You know, if you went to the same kind of school that I went to, they tell you things about the Industrial Revolution. In, in England, starts in England, they say, and in Europe. 
They say that this industrial revolution came about because there used to be like a group of independent hat makers who then they sort of got together in, in these guilds and things like that. And then they worked hard and then the other groups came together. And then as a consequence of this, they developed uh, uh, a lot of strength and, and uh, eventually uh, they changed, transferred, they transformed the economy uh, uh, revolutionary ideas by people like Rousseau and John Locke, you know, became popular and masses rose up and overthrew everything. But that's the root of the Industrial Revolution is that these groups of hat makers, groups of little forces who were independent workers banded together in these guilds, then factories and things like that about nonsense. The root of the, the transformation in Europe was what was being stolen out of Europe. It was not something that happened inside Europe that was the origin of the social transformation of the, or even the economic transformation in Europe. It was the loot that was coming from out of Europe that created this tremendous abundance. That's the basis of like the development of the factories and the rest of that came out of the resources that was coming from the slave trade and other things. Let me show you. Like the whole ports like in Liverpool and I don't know how many other cities in England as an example were built around trading in black people. Mm -hmm. You have you have metal works beginning to improve. Yeah. Huge numbers of people now working together, building, working on metal because they have to make metals for ship fittings. Mm -hmm. They have to make shell metals for collars mm -hmm. and yeah. chains and, and stuff to go around Africans. Mm -hmm. And you see the same thing beginning to happen in ship building itself. Mm -hmm. Whose groups now need them because they got to build a whole bunch more ships than what they were building before. You have innovations, various kinds of technological innovations going into shipping and to other kinds of technology uh, and industry based on the trade in black people. You have now the emergence of a whole class of people who, who are now known as workers who didn't exist before. There was no working class. There was like the serfs and the nobility and the rest of it. But here becomes, here is the basis for the transform, technological transformation that occurs inside Europe. In fact, the sucker got a job, <laughs> the working class got a job because you were enslaved in Africa. Mm -hmm. We're talking about political economy here. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you begin to see the whole transformation of Europe. Now, you see uh, also this new group beginning to emerge uh, in Europe. This, these are the so called, these are like the entrepreneurs, the mercantilists, if you will. These are the, some of them were pirates like John Hawkins and, yeah. and other forces who came to be heroes in European history and the rest of it. But a new group of people uh, began to emerge who now accumulated so much wealth as a consequence of piracy, slave trade, and things like that, that they could challenge, actually challenge the nobility. They had more money than the kings and queens and shit. And they actually began to raise up demands, like one of the popular demands of the time was for free trade, yeah. right? Now, and that's the thing that George Herbert Walker Bush is always talking about protecting, free trade and the rest of it. But the term free trade was given birth by this during the slave trade, when the nobility had a monopoly on, on selling black people, trading in black people, and, a, and the entrepreneurs, this rising entrepreneur, wanted to also sell black people, and they demanded free trade, free trade in black people. You understand? This is the origin of the concept. Lords of London was born during the slave trade. The stock market in this country was started during the slave trade. The first stock was us. We're talking political economy here. You understand? Ain't no mystery in the shit. Right. See, so in, you see you have all of these Africans who are leaving there, then you have as a consequence of the Africans resulting in the technological transformation inside Europe, then slavery becomes outmoded. They don't need slaves no more, what they need is the loot, is the mineral wealth, what they need are the oils the, uh, uh, and other things that comes from the earth that can now feed the factories. So slavery is out, and now direct colonialism. So they, there's this scramble for Africa, a new scramble for Africa, a war being made against Africa to take over the whole thing, and then the white man dominates us personally there on the continent itself, having us digging in the mines, having us working on the plantations and the rest of that, bringing our wealth that's using the same routes, the same economic structures that were started with slavery, are now used to transfer all the goddamn wealth out of Africa to, to uh, America and to Europe. Mm -hmm. 
America gets richer and richer, Europe gets richer and richer, and Africa gets poorer and poorer. So that goes on up until around the Second Imperialist War. And the Second Imperialist War, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, let's go to the Second Imperialist War. By this time, the, the situation is such that the white people are looking for a new deal because they, they want to, uh, to redivide the world. That the first world war was fought for that purpose. Now, a whole new war is getting ready to be fought to redivide the world between the white powers. And now Japan has entered the picture mm -hmm. because Japan figures that white power should not dominate Asia. Japan should dominate Asia. <laughs> so uh, you have all these thugs and looters uh, who want to redivide the world among themselves. Germany felt like it got a bad deal during the Versailles Treaty in the, after the First Imperialist War. It wants some more than action. Of course, Germany is kicking ass all over Europe, just uh, 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 trans transforming every damn thing. So a whole war among white people to re redivide the world. And it's crucial for us to understand that because people talk about the Second Imperialist War as some kind of war of the good guys and the bad guys, you know, and Germany was the bad guy, and the rest of these suckers was the good guy. But if, if you want to look at it in practical quantitative terms, and in qualitative terms, actually, Germany was the lesser of all evils as far, I mean, if you had to pick them out, because it was the British who had an empire upon which the sun never set. It was the British and the French who had African colonies all over the goddamn place. I mean, Germany had some as well, but these were the dominating forces. It was the Dutch who was stepping on our neck in what they call South Africa and the rest of it. I mean, you know, here, but the, the real thug had history had to be the Germans. Why? Because ultimately, and that's, this is after the goddamn fact, of course, the Germany lost, so that's, you didn't write the history. That's one reason it was a, a bad guy. <laughs> uh, but the other reason that Germany had to be the bad guy is because Germany did to white people what white people had always been doing to the rest of us. And that was the no-no. That was the terrible thing. That was broke all the rules of warfare that had come into existence since slavery. Up until the, oh, before slavery, white people killing each other off like flies all over Europe. But with the advent of slavery and the advent of, of white capitalism, white people's killing everybody else. And you break the rule when you, white people start killing white people, and that was the crime of Germany. Yeah. Which is why Hitler is a bad guy. But how can Hitler be worse than Roosevelt? Right. How can Hitler be worse than Churchill? You know, that's impossible. That's impossible. As much thuggery. How can Hitler be worse than King Leopold from Le from from uh, from uh, Belgium? That's if, if you know anything about what these people have done to the rest of us. Leopold by himself killed more people in the Belgian Congo, what we call the Belgian Congo, than Hitler killed than Hitler did, and all the Nazis. So, you know that's really Im important. You know it was a war of thugs. Uh, that's why I'm even upset when I hear people talk about. You know, uh, here Mandela with his little silly, dumbass self um, uh, saying shit like, uh, they are like Nazis, talking about the South African government. What do you mean, Nazis? What the hell are you talking about, Nazis? I mean, it was George Washington who had slaves and shit like that. It was, it was Thomas Jefferson who was a slave owner, right here. Who was killing the guy? It was Kit Carson who was murdering fucking Indians all over this guy. What no goddamn Hitler? Hitler is a Johnny come lately. Yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about? And and but that's become the reference point even for the oppressed people. Hitler's become the reference points of evil, even for you. Yeah. You got both feet in the oven yourself, and you're talking man, about uh, and somebody named uh, uh, Roosevelt is doing it to your ass, and you're talking about Hitler. You're supposed to hate Hitler. But you're damn sure ain't supposed to hate him worse than you hate George Washington. You'd be a lunatic. You'd be a frothing at the mouth, uh, jump out a 10 story building, crazy ass lunatic to, to hate Hitler worse than, than uh, Thomas Jefferson or some of these other clowns around here. But we see the, the, how this whole structure now, instead of slavery, it's just loot. It's, it's gold, it's silver, it's bauxite. Uh, it's cocoa beans, uh, it's coffee, 
uh, uh, and in Kenya right now it's flowers. <laughs> you know, pe people ain't got nothing to eat in Kenya, but at least uh, uh, you know they got flowers at weddings in New York. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that's uh, happening structurally with the political economy. And then uh, what happens? The Second Imperialist War, uh, when the when the white world goes to war with each other, the rep the peoples of the world get a little breathing space, and they break free, and then you see this, high, this rising tide of national liberation struggles all over the world. Everybody's breaking loose, trying to break loose, making struggle. Wars of national liberation really kick off then. The Chinese, of course, in 1949 did the job and set the terms, you know, like for most of the oppressed peoples around the world. And who really was great for us because it taught us that the white man could, could get his ass kicked. China did it for us, and, uh, and that was magnificent uh, for everybody. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, like I said, that happened uh, during the Second Imperialist War. And then what happened was the, the imperialist powers around the world fell back on this thing that they call neocolonialism. Uh, and this was really uh, helped as a consequence of the Mau Mau in Kenya. When the, when, the Mau, when the Kenyans rose up in the form of the Kenyan Land Freedom Army uh, and uh, did a magnificent job of really terrifying the whole white world uh, because they started taking off heads and uh, just really made a great revolutionary uh, struggle, uh, perhaps the most important in Africa. I mean, a lot of stuff happened since then, and Kuma stuff in, in Ghana and the rest of it, but the Kenyans, the thing that made Kenya so significant is they engaged in armed struggle, and they lost. I mean, uh, the, the, the Kenyan Land Freedom Army, known as the Mau Mau, were defeated. Uh, Didan Kimati, you know, uh, was killed by the British. They caught him and executed him and the rest of it. And they went into jail and got this Uncle Tom out of jail named Joe Mikayata, put him in power as the new president. And this was neocolonialism, you know, one of the most important aspects of neocolonialism that occurred in Africa, but it was a phenomenon that was being, that was to occur all over the world. Neocolonialism, of course, uh, was an instance where uh, because the struggle had reached such a high level and people would not go down with white power no more, it became necessary to disguise <coughs> white power in a black face. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all over Africa, the British and other European powers began to retreat. They called it a retreat anyway. They gave, they, sometimes they actually sat down at tables, at so-called round table discussions, and they helped the, 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 the people write up new constitutions. Here's the slave master sitting down with the slave, writing a constitution with him for, for his freedom. They gave the Negroes flags. They had brilliant ceremonies where they were raising up the flag ceremonies at midnight, you know, or one past midnight, blowing the horns, tooting the horns and shit like that. And then the Europeans left from obvious sight. But the problem is that they still control the economy of Africa. And the other thing is that they had divided Africa up in such a way uh, during the 19th century, uh, the so-called Berlin Conference, presided over by the Pope, the Catholic Pope. Right. That's why I'm Catholic now. Right? <laughs> That's why the Catholic Pope looks so much like a, any other member of the Ku Klux Klan. Right? <laughs> but they divided, uh, they divided Africa in the 19th century, I think 1885. 1885, something like that, at the Berlin Conference. And so now, they, they, now all, you got all these little uh, illegitimate entities that call themselves states and nations. You know, uh, you, you look at a map of Africa, this illogical gerrymandering is what they used to call it in this country of Africa. So that's responsible for much of the internecine warfare, the craziness that happens in Africa today is because it didn't have any logic to it all, the dividing up. It was just, we want this, we want this, and they just divided up and gave different white people different uh, mm -hmm. uh, parts of Africa. Call this, you know, it gave them crazy names. Do you know, like, you've heard of Cameroon, right? <laughs> well, you know, Cameroon was uh, colonized uh, uh, at one time, but Portuguese was there. Do you know what ca Cameroon means in Portuguese? It means shrimp. And because they got a lot of shrimp there. So the people uh, in Cameroon, they, they walk around and call themselves shrimp. I'm a Cameroonian. You know, I'm a shrimp. <laughs> you know, uh, and people got these names because that's, you know, what there, there was the Gold Coast because they was getting a lot of gold. There was the Ivory Coast because they was getting a lot of ivory over there. So you got some sort of call themselves Ivorian. How the heck you know? Uh, and uh, all of these, that's like I used to be calling myself Joe. <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> Uh, but they divide.
divided it up and, and uh, they made it uh, the whole division of Africa and uh, made bringing the loot out, made it conducive to just bringing the wealth out to the vi different uh, colonial powers and made it harder for Africa to consolidate itself as one entity, right? They, 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 they divided up in so many entities and made a little president here, a little prime minister here, and all these little suckers fighting for their own little piece. They knew what they were doing. They sent all of these Negroes to the same schools. You understand? Most of them went to the same schools if they went to school at all. Sometimes they didn't go to school. They just had a white man who was really running things behind, and sometimes they still left in Africa right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they went to the same military schools, Sandhurst for the British, West Point uh, for, for uh, some in this country, from Nigeria and the rest of it. And so, the, and now you have a situation where only 3% of the so-called trade in Africa happens inside Africa. 97% or more of all of what they call trade is resources leaving Africa, coming to Europe, coming to North America, and increasingly to Japan. That is the vicious trap that we're in. The resources, all the ports, all the railroads, everything, started off the trails for the slaves. <coughs> then after slavery was ended, the trails just to be shooting the loot during colonial, the colonial period, and now neocolonialism, the same thing. I, don't, I bet you, I'm willing to say that there has not been three universities built on the continent of Africa by Africans since colonialism. Maybe not two. Maybe not even a single university. You understand? All of the resources go out. Everything goes out. Africa has nothing. But what Africa does have, and they, and they, they use these divisions that they created to keep Africa at odds with itself, at war with itself. And they use this elite force that they raised up as their own children and in their own image, as traitors who keep the masses of the rest of us down. They send them tons and tons of weapons. None of the weapons are good to do anything against them, but they're good enough to hold the masses of people down there. That's part of what they did to Saddam Hussein. All, this, all the weapons they said Saddam Hussein said, they, couldn't, they didn't sell, him, sell Saddam nothing that he could use to fight them with. You saw how useless it was against them. It's shit that they could use, he could use right there. He could use it against the Iranians, who they were also arming in a similar fashion, etc. They're the ones who built the bunkers. That's why they was almost sure they could find Saddam and kill him, because they're the ones who built the goddamn bunkers that they was hiding in. Mm. So that's, that's, you know, uh, the relationship that Africa continues to have, even now with Europe and with North America. But the thing that Africa has as well is millions of African people who are becoming increasingly conscious of what our task is and who we are. Not only is that true in Africa, but that's true in other places in the world too. And what Africa has also is from 40 to 60 million or more Africans who are located right here in the heart of imperialism. Because the problems of Africa, the profound most important contradictions of Africa are not in Africa. They're in Washington, D.C., and they're on Wall Street right here in this country. And it is our task, Africans, is to make a revolutionary struggle that recognizes that it is a part, that is to say, the U.S. front of the African Revolution. Mm -hmm. When we make this revolution, we fight for Africa, right. all of its children, etc., and we fight for the rest of the oppressed peoples on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. We believe that this is a just struggle that anybody can unite with, anybody should unite with. That is the way that we can build a world that is truly at peace, because there can never be peace as long as the resources of the world uh, uh, facing the kind of dislocation that they are currently uh, face, facing, as long as a handful of people in the world enjoy the resources that's produced by the vast majority of the people on the planet Earth, there's going to be war. That just makes sense. So anybody who really want peace then have to come together to destroy this terrible white power that has been imposed on, those, on everybody on the planet at the point of a gun. The North American and European populations which have been, been bribed by gluttony and waste of all these resources, have to reject it and have to join the rest of the human beings, have to end 
your voluntary isolation from the rest of the human beings on the planet, have to end your voluntary segregation from everybody else, have to join with the rest of the humanity to fight this terrible enemy that's oppressing everybody on the world and making them enemies of you. That's right. Because there is no way that the North American and European population can be considered allies of the rest of the peoples on the planet Earth as long as they sit on their asses and enjoy the wealth that's starving our babies. The bread from the babies of our mouths are going to feed white babies, are going to feed white people, and white people are going to have to reject that and say that I cannot eat a morsel of bread that comes like this. I will take my chances with the rest of the people of the world to destroy this kind of social system that's based on that. That's what has to happen. Uhuru, I'm sorry I took so much time. <laughs>